wind speed, pressure, and humidity, though we have a, a note on that, uh, especially because we think the priority should be measurement of absolute water vapor. We also need to understand how that water vapor is actually changing with the regolith and coming back out. So we need simultaneous measurements at height. In order for that to be comparable to other missions, it should be at about 1.5 meters. We need it also at the surface, so about like a centimeter or so away from the surface and then in the regolith. But even after you get all that data, people are going to want uh, actual confirmation that a liquid forms. So we also need uh, measurements of within the regolith to detect the liquid form. Uh, next slide. So going back through all of these, um, our note for the near surface environment is that for humidity, we have thus far only been measuring relative humidity with respect to ice. And for a while there in the literature, there was the issue where those measurements were being put on top of the phase diagrams, which are actually with respect to liquid. Those two measurements are not compatible. The point of this slide is to demonstrate that if you did that, an MSL would look as if you could readily form liquid, but once you fixed it, like it is on the bottom plot, you see that the data is further away from the liquid formation zone. The issue there too, though, is, next slide, that once you take those data from relativity with respect to ice and actually uh, translate it over to with respect to liquid, you translate all of that and propagate all of that error, you have really large error bars to the point where like you're seeing in this slide where we have the error box being represented by the magenta box and the purple box over two data points, which within error would allow for liquid formation. The error is rather large because of that translation. So we need to either measure directly relatively with respect to liquid or measure the absolute water vapor. Next slide. We need to better know the surface exchange of water vapor. We know that there are processes within the regolith, so such as physisorption, where it's expected that at nighttime you will adsorb water vapor onto regolith grains and then during the daytime be desorbing. Um, and we also have other active water vapor sinks and sources. So measuring the water vapor at different heights, we're able to see the exchange uh, from the regolith into the atmosphere and back. Next slide. And then in order to do the direct measurements um, to identify liquid formation, what this slide is showing you is that if you take the direct data from the Phoenix lander and you put it on the phase diagram, you, we would expect surface deliquescence to occur just because there's points within the liquid zone. But if you use that as a boundary condition and then you simulate what the subsurface environment would be like, we can see that the subsurface environment is actually more apt to forming metastable solutions. So we'll go from maybe 2% of the year, there'll be a liquid on the surface to in the subsurface, you can go all the way up to 10% of the Martian year, there could be a liquid. So we would want the measurements to be closer to about eight to 10 centimeters at depth if we are trying to identify liquid formation. And also the note here is that the type of liquids that we're forming are very small. These are tiny droplets. Um, and so we'll need the sensitive equipment to make those measurements to identify when we're forming these brines. And then the last slide was repeating what we, the type of measurements that we are requesting, and I was going to leave it off there. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, while we transition to the next speaker, if there's anybody who has a question online or in person. I think I'm super sorry about the hiccup. So we have an online question. I mean, in person, my apologies. This is sorry, from, uh, sorry, this yeah. is from Mohammed Assam to everyone. And the question is, is it possible that the humidity ratio in the atmosphere or on the surface has an impact on the formation and tracks of dust devils? That's a great question. I'm not a sedimentology person. So Brian is in the room and I know Brian does dust devils. Sorry, the question was, what is, what is the question? Oh, uh, humidity ratio of the atmosphere. Um, I suppose if you could cement the the dust in place with with frost, then that would prevent formation of dust double track. Does that does that get at your question there? But I I don't know why humidity itself would 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 uh, affect the formation of dust double tracks. Perfect. Thanks. All right, let's go ahead and keep moving forward, and we can continue these discussions in the discussion panels later in the week. These are. Great things to bring up later. For now, we're gonna move on 
and talk about planetary snow, frost, and ice. And uh, Kai Williams will be giving this talk. And Kai, if you don't mind, just um, we'll go ahead and move the slides forward so we avoid any technical difficulties. Just tell me when you want me to move them forward. Okay, that's fine. Some of the um, uh, advancings will be, you know, animations, but yeah, that should work. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you. I'm Kai Williams. I'm going to talk a little bit about the planetary snow, frost, and ice modeling and measurements. And um, these uh, two concepts of modeling and measurements, I feel, go hand in hand. It's really hard or, or almost impossible, in fact, to dissociate one from the other. And so um, uh, this talk will include both. OK, next slide, please. All right, so for an outline, going to talk a little bit about basic terminology. I apologize for, for the folks here who will find this um, perhaps uh, a little bit unnecessary, but I just feel like sometimes we're, we're not always on the same page with terminology. Um, then I'm going to go on to some examples of planetary snow, permafrost, ice, and ice caves. And these will be heavily skewed towards Earth, though I will measure or er, mention Mars as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the modeling, and that's where you'll see the equations. And then the final slide will be, okay, given those equations, what measurements do we need? What can we calculate, and but what do we need measured? Um, okay, next slide, please. So I think all of us know what snow is, so I won't belabor that. Um, but the, just to emphasize that there's a distinction to be made between snow and, say, a slab of ice sitting on the surface. I know that fundamentally they're composed of the same types of things, but snow is a much more subtle and um, um, a difficult to model beast than a slab of ice is. Um, frost is this fluffy stuff we all know that's caused or that's formed by humid air uh, coming in contact with a cold surface. And you see these uh, fluffy crystals. We all know what the regolith is, but when I talk about the regolith surface, I'll um, try to make a distinction between that and what sometimes comes up as the atmospheric surface layer. So in one case, it's the top of the ground, and the other, it's the lowest part of the atmosphere. So I'll try to mention, you know, the surface layer versus the regular surface. I put ice lens in here to remind me to, to mention that we're not going to talk so much about ice structures in the ground. Ice lenses are one of them. You also have ice wedges. You have lots of other things. There's a whole whole um, area of study of these types of things, and people have, have studied these for Earth and, and even for non-Earth stuff. Um, but we're not going to go into ice lensing and things like that in this talk. And then last, ice table. Um, that's the depth where you have basically excess ice, that is ice that exceeds the pore space. Or I suppose we can even include if it's pretty much close to the pore space. OK, next slide, please. All right, let's start with snow. Um, panel on the left is uh, a bunch of temperature profiles of a snowpack at different times of the day. And for those who have studied temperature profiles in the regolith, this looks quite familiar. Indeed, a lot of the physics are very similar. And you can see uh, there's a bit of a temperature gradient at the bottom down there between minus 40 and minus 50. And for those who have studied um, terrestrial soils, say, or even Mars soils, you might say, oh, well, that's obviously due to the geothermal heat flux. That would be true if you were dealing with soils. But with snow, um, you almost invariably have a cold snowpack on top of warmer soil. Not warm soil, but warmer soil. And so the reason for that temperature gradient in a snowpack is due to that and not any kind of geothermal heat flux. Panel on the right shows snow depth SWE, which is snow water equivalent. That's simply, you melt down the snow column, how much water do you have? Depth of water and density. The three of these are plotted on here to show that they are related concepts, but not identical concepts. Um, and yeah, around Julian day 61, you can see there was snowfall 
The overall column average density goes down because fresh snow is fluffy, as opposed to older snow that gets denser. Um, and yeah. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Permafrost, here's an example. Now we make a distinction usually between wet permafrost and dry permafrost. This is wet permafrost because it uh, has a lot of water in it. Permafrost is defined in general as uh, ground that's frozen year round. Um, it's topped by an active layer. That's the layer that defrosts and refreezes every year. And um, here I show one of these things that I'm not going to go into, an ice wedge, just because I wanted to show that that ground is not horizontally uniform. <laughs> I mean, you can see here that, that there's a lot going on. There's plant roots and whatnot. But you can come across something like an ice wedge that then requires different modeling. That's not going to be the same kind of modeling that you need to do when you're off on the edge of this image here in the more uniform uh, soil. OK, next slide, please. OK, here is an example of dry permafrost. Dry permafrost is, again, uh, soil that's been frozen year round. But it didn't. It does not need to have any water in it. And in this case, this is from the Antarctic Dry Valleys. There really isn't any water in the permafrost part of this column here. There's probably a little active layer up at the top there. But most of that bar that you see that says ablation till, most of that is the dry permafrost. And you get down to some depth where you hit massive ice. And so there's your ice table. OK, next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about ice caves. Next, please. So they're defined as rock-hosted caves with perennial ice, not glacier caves. Glacier caves are those things you see on National Geographic where there's this nice uh, cave going into the side of a glacier and blue light everywhere, kind of like this slide looks like. Um, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about rock-hosted caves that have perennial ice. Uh, next, please. They often happen in things like lava tubes or um, pits, cold pits in the ground. Um, you don't need a lot of um, space and you don't need a lot of ice. Um, next, please. These have been verified on Earth. I mean, this one in the upper right is something near my house, so I know it exists on Earth. Um, and they're expected on Mars. We've done some modeling for Mars and ice caves. Next, please. And you don't need huge amounts of ice in that cave to make it qualify as an ice cave. Just a tiny bit is all that's needed. Next, please. Um, and in the summer, you can have a little bit of liquid water in that cave too. And uh, next, please. Often, it's a little bit of a puddle just on top of the ice. Ice is usually on the floor of these caves, not always, but usually. Um, OK, next, please. That's good. So let's talk a little bit about what uh, kind of cave qualifies as an ice cave in terms of the temperature. Um, next, please. Here's an example of what we call a static ice cave. The panel on the left shows the differences in air circulation between the outside of the cave and the inside of the cave, depending on if it's in the, in the summer or the winter. For static ice caves, in the summer, um, the outside air is warmer than that slug of air that's in the cave. And so you don't have any air exchanges. In the winter, however, um, you can get very cold air outside. So cold, it's even colder than that slug of air was in the cave. And so you have an air swap or a, an exchange of air. Um, the panel on the right, shows um, a model output for Mars, where we modeled some of these static ice caves. And it just shows that right before the sun comes up, it's so cold outside that some of that air is, in fact, colder than the air in the cave. And that's when you get those air swap events. Next slide, please. Exposed ice. Um, here's um, oops, there. two kinds of exposed ice I put um, I, I'm showing here um, two different kinds. Um, I presume the ESA image on the right is um, a slab of ice. We don't know for sure. It's hard to tell. Um, but the panel on the left is obviously from Phoenix. 
And there you have ice that are um, probably uh, just a little bit of excess poor ice there, but um, not probably a great deal, a deal of complexity, at least in 1D. Um, but these are relatively straightforward to model because, you know, especially for Mars or the ADVs, if you don't have any melting, uh, um, well, <laughs> in, at least not unless uh, you, 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 um, you have a bunch of uh, salts. But uh, if you're just calculating sublimation, it's pretty straightforward. Next. Okay, for snowpacks though, um, it gets kind of complicated. For snowpacks, they have enough interesting internal structure that you need to actually start tracking the domain um, by some method. And um, I've seen people use a moving boundary approach. And for those that are mathematicians, that's a Stefan problem. Um, that I think has worked in some cases. Stefan problems are usually applied towards um, tracking phase change boundaries. Um, some people have tried naive finite differencing. That is not recommended. It's too hard to conserve mass and energy in your models doing that. Finite volume works pretty well. Um, that is a technique that is loved by engineers and rightfully so, because it's very easy to conserve mass and energy and make sure you're not missing something. Next, please. Now, the thing is, um, um, next, please. With radiative, you're going to have to include a radiative transfer component within the snow column. And the reason you need to do that is obvious in that image on the right. That's an image off the uh, Beartooth Highway in Montana, where you see a bunch of snow layers there next to the road. There's dust in those. And what that means is you have a bunch of absorbers and scatterers now in the snow column. And so you basically need to do a radiative transfer calculation along with your um, heat diffusion. But then there's also another complication that occurs, especially on Earth, you get liquid melt. And it, it often happens at certain points just below the surface of the snowpack. But now you need a vertical advection component to your model too. Next, please. All right, so how do you model these things? Well, the traditional way is to decide on a thin layer at the surface and do an energy budget of that. So notice there's a time variable in here. Um, U is the internal energy of some layer that you have decided on a thickness of. That first term to the right of the equal sign is heat conduction out of the bottom of that layer. Normally you don't include conduction out of the top um, to the atmosphere for certain reasons, but the next term after that is one minus the albedo times the um, insulation, that's the sunlight. Um, then you have emissivity sigma t the fourth, which is your outgoing IR. Your downwelling IR is atmospheric heating. And the last two terms are the sensible heat and the latent heat. And we'll talk about those in a bit. Next slide, please. So what you do is you normally apply the surface uh, energy balance uh, calculation to some setting. And this setting here happens to be on Mars and is on a slope. And so you have a bunch of these different terms and you track them over time. And in this case here, um, we have an additional uh, IR term from a plane that's at the uh, foot of the slope. Next, please. Okay, so the bog standard way of calculating sensible heat and latent heat and those types of terms are using the Mona and Bukov similarity theory. Several people at this conference are very well familiar with that. Um, and these are nothing that 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 uh, confusing, um, but I will point out that um, this is an iterative system, SHLH, L, and U star, calculated in an iterative manner. And so um, I put this up here because I wanted this to sort of show what types of terms, if you're going to calculate your sensible latent heat, what do you need to have from measurements? Um, so I'll point out a few here. Obviously, you need U sub Z, that's wind at some known height Z, you need temperature at Z, you need temperature at the surface. You need roughness length scale Z0, or Z0, I guess we call it here, Zt, and 
ZE. Those are the roughness length scales for momentum, um, heat, and vapor. These A sub H, A sub M, A sub E are stability correction functions. L is the Monobukov length scale, U star friction velocity. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. So if you're going to calculate your downwelling IR at the surface, there's presumably some sort of parameterization you need to do if you don't get it for free out of a GCM or something. And here's an example by Rachel Jordan. She wrote the snow therm snowpack model, and she used cloud cover fraction, N, to give an effective emissivity of the sky for the downwelling IR. This is just an example of you might need to calculate some things, you might need to parameterize some things, and so on. Okay, next slide, please. You will also, of course, need to, and this is a huge, huge variable, get the direct, diffuse, and reflected uh, insulation. This is a whole uh, can of worms because you know you can get a lot of things doing scattering in atmospheres. You can get dust, you can get clouds, all sorts of things. And so the diffuse component is usually a pain to deal with. Um, so best of all would be if you could measure it you know, instead of having to calculate that, because even when you get it out of GCMs, there's issues. Um, okay, next slide, please. And next. Okay, so yeah, so obviously we need to worry about wind. We need to make a distinction between wind speed and wind gusts. Uh, WMO suggests wind measurements at 10 meters above ground level. Next, please. That's not going to work very well, but um, for us, but they like it. And the reason is they are very concerned about being far away from surface roughness elements like trees and bushes and buildings and things like that. Um, next, please. But we like to uh, measure it, us people that actually have to do the measuring more on uh, one and a half to two meter mass. As you can see in these previous talks in this conference. and um, there are issues, obviously, with measuring wind that low, and um, you can have parts of the MET station blocking the wind, so you get turbulent wakes from those, and so you're not getting accurate wind measurements. You can have ground roughness from vegetation or boulders or whatnot that are, that are also causing problems, and so obviously you don't have Z not correct anymore, and you need a displacement height as well. Um, so yeah, you need to keep all this stuff in mind. Next, please. Okay, so basic measurements needed. We obviously need air temperature, RH, and wind. By the way, RH, you know, we really, if we get partial pressure, partial vapor pressure of water, that's fine too. We can convert between RH and that, not a problem. These need to be done at a known height, whether it's two meters, whether it's a meter and a half, it, we have to know the height. We need the ambient pressure. And we need insulation. I highly recommend measuring it rather than calculating it um, for the reasons I talked about before. Next, please. We need the downwelling IR at the surface. We need the albedo of the surface. We need the soil temperature at the surface. We need the thermal conductivity, the density, and the specific heat capacity of the soil and probably some assumptions about what the profiles of those look like. And we need the soil tortuosity and porosity. We need that last bullet there if you are worried about um, vapor transport, say, within the soil pores. All right, next, please. So that's it. And I've, I've left this uh, image on this slide because this shows what can go wrong with putting in a MET station. This is one we put in at the Grand Falls Dune Field. And as you can see here, we have, oh my, these large meter scale roughness elements now that grew up all around the MET station. I can assure you they were not there when we installed the MET station. So uh, yeah, lots of things can happen. Um, next slide, just for the um, references. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, Kai, I say uh, if we had that kind of problem on Mars, I think we'd be happy with it. <laughs> yeah. so that life popped up and damaged our observations. So we have time for uh, a, a minute or two for questions. Um, if we have online or in-person questions for Kai, we have an in-person here. Hi, Kai. Um, this is Lori Fenton from the SETI Institute. How would you go about measuring soil porosity or tortuosity um, from a landed spacecraft? Well, uh, porosity, you can, you can infer if you know bulk density and particle density. Okay. Tortuosity is a, a little bit more of a, of, a, of a difficult problem because that assumes um, a, a certain type of soil structure. Um, but uh, I, I would say we'd have to probably do microscopic imaging or something like that. Hey, Kai, this is Brian Jackson. Yeah, that was a really great talk. I, I appreciated that. I, I really appreciated that list of, of required measurements um, at the end. Um, could you say something about, you, you talked about the need to measure a profile at, at well-defined altitudes. Could you say something about the need to may, maybe measure um, at certain uh, frequencies? Do you have a sense for how, how uh, frequently you need to make these measurements? And I'm, I'm thinking not just of like the, how many times per day, but I'm actually thinking of how many, how many hertz do you need to make these kinds of measurements? Yeah, I would say um, certainly, uh, what was the number I saw earlier? Was it 10 hertz, 20 hertz maybe? That would be overkill, I think. Um, we're, we're interested in, in most of the time in, in mean wind uh, profiles and not the gusts. And the gusts obviously can happen and, you know, pretty quickly. So um, I, think, I think certainly, uh, you know, once a second would be, would be totally fine. Okay, um, thank you very much, Kai. Um, we're gonna go ahead and switch to the lightning session. So whoever that chair is, if they can come out and take over. Yeah, you can. Great, well, welcome to Lightning Talks One. Uh, my name is Peter Tereskevich. I'm from University of South Carolina. Um, and so the way this is gonna work is the uh, presenters will have two minutes to run through a single slide. Um, for presenters, I'll give you about a 30 second warning when you're kind of approaching that deadline. Uh, and then we'll kind of hold all questions towards the end and you'll be able to interact um, with, her, with the presenters. Um, and remember, you can also post those questions inside the chat as well in order to keep things moving along and, you know, kind of don't forget your question for sure. Um, uh, one last note is that remember that these are sort of snippets of their full length presentations that are on the YouTube channel. So if you really like what you're seeing, definitely go check out that full length presentation uh, and then get all the details. Um, so right now we're going to start with our online participants. So that's going to be starting off with Ari um, Kopel. So Ari, whenever you're ready, you can go in ahead and unmute yourself and run through your presentation. Yeah, so that, that was actually a perfect segue from Kai Williams' talk. Um, thanks everyone, my name's Ari Kopel. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but um, it's exciting to participate virtually. Uh, we, in, my, in our research group, are interested in using surface temperatures to make interpretations about geology, both 
trying to figure out what sedimentary environments are on the surface surfaces of planets and Earth. Um, and also to, as was mentioned previously, locate subsurface volatiles and ices. Um, and so we have come up with a methodology that involves setting up a weather station that basically tracks the heat flux into the surface and out of the surface, measuring all of the things that Kai was just talking about. And during that measurement campaign, we also are flying drones with thermal cameras, uh, radiometrically calibrated cameras that are uh, mapping out a scene of interest um, several times a day over the course of, we like to do 72 hour campaigns and we've done this at four different sites now. And so the data I'm showing you here is from a dune site near Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, it's tephra that was uh, emitted by Sunset Crater and ultimately reworked into this Aeolian dune. And uh, you know, one of the trends that you can see coming out of this is that there are thermal trends in these in these dune fields that you might not be able to pick up in visible or even multispectral data that you can pick up in the thermal data, such as the striping in the top left, you can see. Um, and we can figure out what is causing that. Is it something to do with grain size? Is it something to do with porosity? Is it compaction? Um, ultimately, what we do is uh, run all this data through a model that creates a thermal inertia map. And um, then we seconds. use then we use ground truths um, and analysis of samples that we take back to the labs to figure out what the properties at each of these sites are. Um, I'll leave it at that. I have a poster posted online. If you want to learn more, check that out or shoot me an email. I'm happy to chat. Okay, great. All right, so next uh, we have um, Norbert Shortgopper. If you're able to unmute and go ahead and run through your slides. Hello. Okay, yes, I am um, uh, Norbert Shortgopper and my presentation is about uh, the exchange of water vapor between the Martian atmosphere and, and near surface ice. So, so this process of water vapor exchange um, controls to a large extent, you know, huge, um, ice reservoirs uh, on Mars in the, in the mid and, and high latitudes. And uh, what I'm proposing specifically is first a field experiment uh, on Earth be before we go uh, to Mars, because that process doesn't uh, get nearly um, enough attention compared to how um, important it is for Mars. And, and uh, the presentation describes uh, this um, uh, field experiment. And it's difficult uh, to find a place on Earth which is really sublimation dominated because usually one has a snow cover or percolating water and percolating water and leads to mass fluxes which are quickly um, uh, larger than the by vapor diffusion. Uh, but probably the dry valleys of Antarctica, the upper dry valleys of Antarctica are um, uh, a good spot. And uh, what, what I didn't mention in my presentation is I guess um, is Another fairly explored issue is the uh, structure of T-sublimation ice. T-sublimation ice, which forms not on the surface, but directly in the pore spaces, which we uh, also should uh, quantify uh, far better. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a vague introduction to my presentation. Great, thank you much. All right, so next is going to be J.R. Simbelman. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello. I am sorry, I can't be with you guys in person, but uh, this will be an ad to send you to our abstract and we have an e-poster also. Um, 
linked on the LPI website. People have been asking where they, they are. Um, this parameter, aerodynamic surface roughness, has been mentioned several times. I just want to give a simple definition here, a height at which wind speed is zero. The problem is that is not always easy to determine. We extrapolate to it using the law of the wall, which is derived from the prandtl von Karman equation developed in water, but it works for the wind with certain uh, conditions that we need to be aware of. And in particular, Waringa makes the very important statement that's on the slide, and I'll just emphasize the last part of it, extrapolation of the equation below its limit of validity is possible. We really need to be careful how we use this parameter that I think all of us think we understand, but may not. And uh, the central figure at the bottom is from the Waringa paper of three different types of wind flow the bottom one is the one of importance that I ran into in uh, Argentina on a gravel plane where the particles were so close together, it was very clear we were not getting, even a, using the law of the wall, not getting a reasonable estimation for where Z0 was. And it's because of this skimming flow. So the other figures uh, are from the abstract and in the e-poster. In particular, the two on the right are just ways of trying to get a handle on how sensitive our uh, law of the wall fits may be to those two parameters. So I encourage you to take a look. Uh, thanks. All right, so next Hello, we got, can you hear me? Uh, yep. Good to go. Okay, so you can just go to the next slide. Um, so this is continuing from the talk I gave earlier, but providing the motivation, which is we want to understand brine formation on Mars to understand how habitable these liquids might be. Um, and so again, we're back to looking at the phase diagram, except now I have provided data from the Atacama Desert and the Antarctic Dry Valleys to provide a terrestrial context to better understand what we mean as how hyper-irid Mars is. Um, the reason we want these type of measurements like relative humidity with respect to liquid is that when abrine forms, if it is at equilibrium with the ambient atmosphere, its water activity will be related to the relative humidity. So if the relative humidity is 60, the water activity is gonna be 0.6. Um, and we think that most microorganisms have a tolerance down to about 0.56 water activity. So that would be 56% relative humidity. Um, and so if you look at this phase diagram, uh, at that 0.56, uh, in terms of the temperatures that we think uh, we're using for Mars to understand if something on Mars is habitable, it would be about 250 Kelvin. Uh, we're nowhere near Mars relevant combinations of conditions. However, we actually have a lot of data showing that there are active metabolic rates for, of microbes all the way down to about 233 Kelvin. And what actually happens below that is that microbes go into a dormant phase. So at the Mars relevant combinations of temperature and humidity, if a brine were to form where the water activity is okay for life, what would happen is that it could allow for a certain transient environment where that dormant life could come back, make use of that water, and then go back to sleep once it's used it. So this is why we need to better understand the brine environment on the surface of Mars. Thanks. Awesome, thanks. All right, the next we got Matthew Lapotre. All right, um, hi everyone. So in our abstract and presentation, uh, my co-authors and I highlighted several recent advances in the field of alien science on Mars. Several uh, remaining questions, as well as potential measurements to pave the way for more discussions at this workshop. And if you haven't checked them out yet, I invite everyone to read abstract uh, number 7010 and watch the corresponding presentation on YouTube uh, as they contain a lot more details and references about these advances and questions. Uh, but for now, briefly here, why should we care about alien processes on Mars? Well, 
alien processes are at the heart of several big topics that have been central to or even driving the Mars exploration program to date, including the characterization of modern and paleo environments, astrobiology, and human exploration. And this diagram here is somewhat reminiscent of uh, what uh, Tim showed us earlier. Uh, it highlights several aspects of alien processes that would strongly benefit from dedicated in-situ investigations. And in our presentation, we focused on sediments, bed forms, winds, sand fluxes, erosion rates, and deposits, summarizing big unknowns in Mars alien science in the form of eight questions. And again, this is really the meat of our presentation. I really invite everyone to go check out the, the video and abstract. Central to uh, these questions are to quantify transport thresholds, aerodynamic roughness, and bed form of aerodynamics. And all of these questions could be answered from a relatively small number of measurements by a dedicated in-situ exploration mission, including minimally invasive wind measurements, such as isolated vertical arrays of anemometers, or even better, Doppler LiDAR, or um, a PIV if power and data rate permit to characterize typical roughness length scales, and constrain transport thresholds over a variety of surface types, such as bedrock, sand sheets, bed forms, but also under variable saltation intensity. We also need to characterize full grain size distributions as opposed to conducting surface counts from images, which could be done, for example, using a system of nested sieves. And finally, imaging ought to be an important component to any upcoming in situ investigation of alien processes, as high speed, high resolution imaging of saltation would allow us to characterize quantitatively saltation trajectories and grain speeds as well as through long-term monitoring the morphodynamics of aeolian bed forms. And that's it, thank you. Great, thank you much. And then now we're gonna transition into our in-person presenters. Okay, so uh, Jenny Radabaugh is going to be next up. So I'm going to pass this off for you. Thank you. Sorry, there's sound in that video, which we don't need, but <laughs> we could have it. So uh, we have been studying a region in Argentina, um, the Altiplano Puna region, and Jim Zimbelman's done lots of work there, and as well as others here. Uh, the reason is that it's it's very similar in condition to uh, Mars and also has landforms like those we see on Mars. So there are yardangs there, wind carved ridges. And here are some yardangs in Gusev Crater on Mars. Uh, these are typically very long and very straight compared to dunes, uh, elongated in the direction of the wind, we think. But uh, we need more measurements of actual winds operating on yardangs to understand that better. And then also yardangs can be continuous or discontinuous. You can see a little bit of discontinuousness among these Gusev yardangs. And we're kind of questioning why there is discontinuousness, especially among the yardangs of the Puna. So here's a, a way zoomed in view of some yardangs and uh, most of them are discontinuous. They can be kind of isolated. You can see this one kind of lone yardang that we focused on right here. We looked in this region so that the winds could be unobstructed by other yardangs around it and uh, examined winds on this particular yardang. Um, I don't know if we can click on the video to show it going or if you just escape out of it and then maybe restart it. Sorry about that. Yeah, that one right there. Thanks. Yeah. Put some uh, smoke candles up and watch the wind around, around the yarding. The wind, as you can see, is not really coming from the blunt nose and then going in the tapered downwind direction like you'd expect. And so we were there for about five days. And during the whole time, the winds were from a different direction than, than we think is typical for this region. Um, but it was really instructive because you can see some shaping of the Ardang as a result of that sort of secondary wind. We even think there's a reverse wind from the back of the Ardang in, in addition. So if you have a few different winds, we think that's what causes the segmenting of these Ardangs. We also have a few anemometers up. Laura Kerber's up on the top of the Ardang for scale. She's got a little anemometer by her, and there are a couple of others forward and behind and on either side. And we're uh, integrating all of that data, putting it into some computational fluid dynamics models of flow around the yardings and trying to better understand how they get shaped over time. The thing we like about these, sorry, I know that's it, is uh, we can also bring really compact handheld instruments, check them on the airplane, even carry them on, 
and we try to stay very sleek as we go out in the field with, with these instruments. Thanks. All right, and then next up is gonna be Christy Swan. I did not read the instructions correctly. And so this is a two minute video that I'm gonna talk through. Um, I just wanna start by saying I can't do any of this work without recognizing an incredible team of engineers that I get to work with. Um, so they help me develop a system that is going to be shown soon. Okay, so the reason that we're interested in looking at natural boundary layer turbulence is because as you move further and closer away from the surface, represented in a time average since it's along the wall, you, you vary in your fluctuation. So what is our sampling volume and frequency? And our traditional sensors use these point observations and integrate over those to be able to try to get a shear velocity so that we can predict sediment transport. So what we wanted to do was to move beyond point observations and um, develop the first uh, pill, filled particle tracking velocimetry system by seeding the air with these really tiny helium bubbles, having them fly through um, a laser sheet, and then those helium bubbles scatter the light, which are recorded on um, high resolution cameras. So this is what the natural boundary layer actually looks like. Our cameras are sampling at about 800 frames per second. Um, these are some of the more traditional sensors that you see here on the right. So we're integrating about um, over about 10 to 15 centimeters there. But if you visually just look at the comparison between what the integration that we're doing over 10 to 15 centimeters relative to the variability that we're actually seeing in our boundary layer, there's quite a discrepancy. This is whenever we're doing image subtraction to be able to track individual particles. And we can also reduce a lot of the reflection that we see at the bed. That's one of the issues that we definitely have with the system. The reason we wanna track those individual particles through space and through our volume is so that we can actually get the vertical velocity vectors and how they're changing in space and time. So that's what we're seeing here. This is a pretty terrible representation of a static <laughs> scale bar for velocities, but um, you can do quite a bit over just a short period of time. You can get um, ISO velocity maps, and you can also do Reynolds de um, stress decomposition um, over space. And this is over about a one, one by one by a 20 centimeter or 50 centimeter area. So we're actually, right now, my engineers and I are miniaturizing this for Mars so that we can not just get um, the fluid flow, but also the saltation. So we can do both with one instrument. Thanks. Awesome, thanks, Chris. So thank you to all the Lightning Talk presenters. Um, I think we're gonna go ahead and break for lunch. But real fast, we do have another lightning talk session this afternoon, and that's on instrument uh, demonstrations. Uh, so anyone who's bringing an instrument to the field, if you want to talk again, you can. Uh, or anyone else that has an instrument, uh, just let me know that you want to get into the lineup for that one. We have a few spots. Otherwise, we are reconvening at 